If you want to close sales, you have to ask questions, listen, demonstrate that you have empathy, meaning you understand their situation, meaning they know that you understand their situation. And when you make a suggestion, AKA a call to action or an attempt to close, uh, then it's more like prescribing them a solution to their problem, which they're more apt to take to the pharmacy in this example, uh, versus trying to sell them something. It's Welcome to the Magnificent Marketing Podcast, where we interview the top marketing experts in the world and keep you up to date on all the changes and best practices to help you grow your business and stay on the cutting edge. Welcome to the show. Hello, everyone. I'm here today with Ryan Stuman, who is a five-time best-selling author, sales trainer, and entrepreneur. He is also a regular contributor to Forbes, Entrepreneur, and many other major publications. And today, we are going to talk about how to get everything you need to know out of an initial sales call to close more sales. Ryan, how are you doing today? I am awesome. I'm excited to be here. And, uh, and have a conversation with you and, and maybe uh, give some good ideas to your audience out there. So thanks for having me on. Sounds perfect. And, very, and I love your enthusiasm. <laughs> That's always, it always gets my juices flowing. Well, uh, yeah, I, uh, you know, you're the hardcore closer. So um, definitely, definitely uh, I think your topic and your information is going to have a lot of people's eyes and ears open to uh, see what you got to say. But um, – and I know we're going to be talking about how to get everything out of the initial sales call, but before we go there, um, you know, sometimes some preps needed. So, w what sort of prep do you recommend doing beforehand before you jump on on a sales call? Well, we do what's called social reconnaissance, okay. and uh, if you think about reconnaissance, that's where you go like undercover and you're trying to check out the, uh, you know, in, in war terms, it's the enemy. But obviously your prospect's not your enemy, but you are at some degree in a battle with them, right? A battle of ego and wits and needs and wants. And so what we do is social reconnaissance. So we go on people's social media accounts and actually we have a little system that pulls all the, the social media stuff in one through Infusionsoft. And, uh, and it shows us all their social media posts and everything else so we can see the kind of things that they are posting about not so much that we can see you know what they need as far as our service but we know that if uh, John Doe fills out a lead form and then we go on his Facebook page and we see that he took his kids to the zoo last week and we go on and, and when we finally get on the sales call attempt we know that we can drop casually it's like hey he's interested in the zoo and stuff so I can't think about taking my kids to the zoo, man, do you have a good recommendation? And obviously he's going to either, or you can position it as, hey, I, you know, I looked on your Facebook page and I want to kind of see the person you are and stuff. Looks like you took your kids to the zoo, man. How is it there? And you've got a way to start building that familiarity and bonding with them. And, you know, you might, uh, you might find, like, most people's Facebook walls and, and Twitter accounts are wide open. So you can get an idea of the kind of things that they talk about so you can uh, have a better idea of the personality behind the person when you reach out to them. You know, it just kind of helps you make it more personal. And people put stuff on social media because they want other people to see it. That's like the whole idea of social media in the first place. And so when you, you know, acknowledge that you saw what they wanted people to see and everything, you oblige them for what they wanted, it, uh, it really makes them feel good too. At least that's the experience that we have. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that, that, that's interesting. It looks like you're, you're definitely, you know, angling on, on the personal uh, touch, the personal research of your contact. Is, is that the, is that the kind of research, you know, the initial research you, you deem vital uh, or in addition to that, I mean, uh, you know, is it research on the company, research on any competitors or anything like that? Or do you mainly, you know, going in, you know, you know, lean heavier on the, the personal information? Well, it's, if I'm trying to do business with a company, uh, then, you know, I might care more about the company uh, information. But for me, uh, my business, my, my coaching business is based on individuals that work for companies or own a company, right? So not necessarily the, uh, the company. So I think that, especially in my business, because it's a very personable business, because we're going to be working closely together, uh, it, it has to be, uh, I have to know you on a personal level for, for the stuff to, you know, for us to get full effects and everything. So, yeah, I believe that that is important because if you take the wrong type of person on, the wrong type of personality for what you're doing or, uh, you know, like you can go on someone's Facebook wall, for example, 
And if it's a constant slew of complaints and bitching about Donald Trump and everything else and nothing's right and this is their third job change that you can see on their wall and stuff like that, I, this is not somebody I'm going to reach out to. That's not a hot lead to me. You know, that's not the, the, the type of person that, uh, that we're looking for, someone that has a lot of excuses and quits and complaints. So it allows us to not even deal with calling that lead and just – you know, some people probably are out there from time to time. They'd be like, those dudes didn't even call me because they we probably looked them up and they didn't fit the mold. And mm -hmm. that's okay. You know what I mean? But I don't want to uh, sell to the wrong people or waste my time trying to, to help the wrong people either. So I believe getting to see what their personality type is like and getting to know a little bit about them from a digital standpoint uh, really helps a lot before you go into a sales call. Yeah, that's awesome advice. Awesome. Appreciate that. Now, w w one last uh, kind of prep question here before we, we get into some of the good stuff. Um, you know, I, I've often, often have, you know, dealt with this and, and had sales reps kind of not really know what direction to take. But, you know, as far as doing the research and then making the calls, you know, and, and you know, it might vary between the the size of the sale or the opportunity. So what kind of balance do you do or have you experienced in the past between doing research and then the actual selling? Because, you know, some people are needing to make lots of calls and get out there and then obviously other deals, sometimes there's not many calls being made and it's, you know, they're bigger deals, less of them. Um, so what kind of balance do you strike for, you know, uh, for the kind of, re the amount of research you do based on the kind of sale it is? Does that make sense? Yep. So Abraham okay. Lincoln once said, if he had five minutes to chop down a tree, he'd spend three of them sharpening his axe. Uh -huh. And so that means that he spent three minutes working on making his tool sharper uh, so it's more effective, and he's got two minutes to actually do the work. And I think that the same thing applies in the sales world. You know, you should spend your time because if you get – here's here's the problem. Like a, 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 a person, a salesperson will get ten leads in their inbox – and they feel this this massive amount of pressure, like they got to rush through, you know, like I got to get in touch with these guys as soon as possible, because uh -huh. that's what's been beaten into us by sales managers uh -huh. and mentors and everything else for for decades now, right? And and so you're under all this pressure, and uh, you try to go through the leads as quick as you can, so you can get your hands on more. You know, they got the churn and burn method. But the truth is, if you'll take the time and look, you might realize that out of those ten leads, only two of them actually even qualify. Uh -huh. uh, you, you, like I said, you go to their Facebook page, you realize that they're a fit, some of them aren't a fit. And so you're spending that time becoming more effective by doing that research. And so, you know, some, like I said, some leads don't even deserve to be called. It's, it's uh -huh. just a part of it, right? Not everybody qualifies. And, and if you'll spend time doing research up front, you'll get a lot less no's. And now here's the thing that's, that's real powerful in this is when a salesperson gets a lot less no's then their confidence goes up, right? And yep. one of the problems that we have with salespeople, a lot of us drink and smoke and everything else is because people are constantly berating us and, and we've got to have thick skin and they're telling us no and turning us down and saying, don't sell me your stuff today, closer, and all these other things, you know. And it makes it, it, makes it difficult, right? I mean, you know, constant rejection and, and having to overcome people that get emotional and egos in the way and everything else. It makes it a very stressful job, but when you, you can get less of that resistance and you can go straight to uh, getting more yeses, it helps your confidence, it helps you feel better as a salesperson, it, your overall morale is better because you're hearing a lot more positive words than you are negative ones, it just helps you avoid the no. A lot of salespeople say every no gets me that much closer to a yes, but if you can avoid the no's and just get the yeses, it would be a lot cooler <laughs> in my opinion, so that's what the research does. Gotcha. So slow down to speed up is what I'm hearing. Yeah, yeah, and and I I can definitely attest to that. Um, you know the morale part. You know if people are calling on a bunch or just if you're just cold calling all the time, you're not going to do that forever. Uh, it, it's tough. It's very tough. People will get burned out, and I guess the same goes even if you are getting leads. The same 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 issues could apply. So um, appreciate that advice. So all right, well, let, let's let's get to the good stuff. You know I'd love for you to share your Share all your secrets with us, Ryan. You know, how, how do you go about getting everything you need to know out of this initial sales call? Well, so what we do is a, a few things. So we have different softwares that tie into our Fusion, Infusion Self account. I don't know what they're called because it's not like my department. I would see how it works. But the, uh, the way that we do things is when someone comes in and they become a lead, and uh, we have, a, you know, we become a lead. Then we have an email system that follows up and tries to get them to commit a little bit deeper. 
uh, and by a little bit deeper, they fill out these forms. So oftentimes just for my, uh, I own an alarm company as well. So for my alarm company and for our seminar company and for our sales training company, when people fill out leads, at one point or another, they're filling out like a, a survey. It's like, it's called WUFUs, the forms that we use, but it's a, a WUFU form that they're filling out online. And we ask them 10 different questions. Uh, like their production and how long they've been in business and what they're looking for help with and what they do for a living, like those kind of things. Uh, to get an overall sense of who they are, then we look them up on social media before we reach out to them. A lot of people will tell you that you got to call a lead within five minutes and all this other stuff. Like if you're selling insurance, maybe, you know, where they like went to, or if you're selling vacation stuff where they went to like a, uh, or a lending tree type of thing, you know what I mean? Like that, you probably do have to call somebody within five minutes, but the way that we position leads is they're unique to us. They're not going anywhere else. And so what we do is we schedule them in. So we get all this information, and it may be four or five days before my salespeople, uh, before they're even able to get on their calendar. We use, you know, uh, automatic schedulers, kind of like what we use to get on the show here. And they'll schedule, my sales guys will schedule their entire weeks out in little 20-minute segments where they're calling these folks. So someone may become a lead, fill out that form, and it may be three days before we talk to them. Well, about 10 minutes before my guys get on the phone with them, they start looking them up on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter to kind of see uh, see how fast the conversation should, should go and, and what program they most likely belong in and all that good stuff. So I think that these days people don't really pay attention to each other. Like when you go to shake somebody's hand, they forget your name immediately. Uh, and, and I'm really good at remembering people's names, so I like to screw with people. I'll say their name to them a few times throughout the night, and I can just see that look on their face like, damn it, I don't know this guy's name, but he knows mine. He's in trouble. <laughs> so, uh, that's me. That's me doing? looking at you yeah. with, that, with that beer in my eyes. Man, that's the number one way to be influenced is, like, just remember people's names because these yeah. days nobody does it. And, yeah. uh, and so anyway, so with the uh, – uh, the scheduler, getting them on the scheduler, it just makes it a lot easier. We look them up because these guys, nobody pays attention to anybody. Like I said, they forget their name and everything else. So if you, uh, as a salesperson or a business owner or whatever it is that you do, if you can show up and show them that you've been paying attention to them and that you know their name, you know about their business, you look them up on social, they'll, like, if you want people to be interested in what you have, you have to be interested in them. And that's the best way to show it. You know, it's like you – you, uh, if you're selling B2B stuff, for example, and you want to meet with the HR director and you go to this Facebook page and you realize the HR director plays golf three times a week or tennis or something like that, then it would be a lot easier for you to send an email that's like two free tickets to play golf, right, or two greens passes, I guess you would say. And, and they're going to open that email line, and because you did a little bit of research, you're going to chance to get four hours in front of them on, on the golf course as opposed to five minutes on the phone. So – just the fact that you're paying attention to people goes a, a really long ways. And people uh -huh. appreciate it, you know. I, pay, I Before we got on here, I looked you up. You know, I realized we're both Texans. It says online that you're down in Austin. And uh, uh -huh. I realized that we're both Texans and stuff like that. That's the same habit goes within me every time that, uh, you know, I have to make an interaction with somebody. We're looking them up online. It's like, please do it. Why shouldn't we? <laughs> Yeah. So what what are some examples of, you know, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I, I love what you're saying. I hear what you're saying, um, you know, but that that's initial. But, you know, once we're in the call, once we get them on the phone, you know, uh, what, what are, you know, some of the skill sets or maybe even some good examples of some initial questions you ask to get into the flow? And, and you know, once you're in the meeting, like, how, how do you pull out all the information that you need you need on that call so that you can, you know, best serve them, best, you know, get a proposal ready for them, you know, just the whole kit and caboodle there? Well, there's a, a couple uh, steps that I like to do in calls. First of all, like to be a good salesperson, you really don't have to talk very much. Um, one of my salespeople was on the phone yesterday just listening in the background with me doing a sales call, and uh, he's a newer guy, so he was kind of listening to how, how I did it. And I got off the phone, he said uh, – I don't think you said 10 words until you actually pitched the guy. You know, I was on the phone with him for probably, I don't know, 45 minutes or so. And I was like, man, if you can get them to open their mouth, they will open their wallet. And the way to get yeah. somebody to open their mouth is to ask them questions and let them talk. And uh -huh. there's two types of questions. There's open-ended questions and closed-ended questions. And oftentimes salespeople, they ask these closed-ended questions, which really limits – the conversation so that they can never get deep enough with the questions. And, and for example, um, Elon Musk, 
was on 2020 and 60 minutes, like, you know, one, one Friday and then Sunday, right? And on 2020, they asked him questions like, so what's next in space? Are we going to Mars or Saturn or Jupiter? And his answers were, no, we don't plan on going to any of those planets right now. And that was about it. When he got down to 60 minutes on Sunday, they said, so what's next for outer space? And he went on to talk 20 minutes huh. about what his plans were for space because that person didn't limit his mind to what's next with Mars, Saturn, or Jupiter. And so a lot of salespeople do that too. They'll say, are you looking to do this or this? And the better question is, what are you looking to do? And uh -huh. that's how you get them talking, right? And so here's what, what else is really cool about asking questions uh, to get people in there. It's like when you're actually paying attention to somebody, that they love it these days, right? Their kids don't listen to them. Their employees don't listen to them. Their wife or husband probably don't listen to them. We got so much noise. We're always staring at our phone, and there you are listening to them. It makes people feel special. It really does. Like these old school techniques still work. They're still like these days they would be considered brain hacks, like going back to the Stone Age way of doing things. But paying attention like that works uh, really well, at, you know, and listening to them. And then here's the thing. Once somebody knows that you're a good listener, you don't have to be a good salesperson. Just, just be a good listener. And once somebody knows that you're a good listener, and you can share, and you can show and demonstrate empathy with them. Empathy meaning that, that that you understand their situation. Well, if they know that you've listened to them and they feel like you understand their situation, when you provide them with the solution, which is whatever it is that you're selling, they feel more enabled to take it, and they feel more enabled like that your suggestion is actually going to get them the results that they want. And a good example of that is like doctors. Doctors are the coldest closers on the planet. They're like, well, if you don't do this, you, you could die. Right? You're like, sure, I'm going to borrow this now. Uh -huh. <laughs> I don't want to die. And, but that's, that's what they do is they go in, they ask you a bunch of questions, right? They, they, you tell them how you feel, and then they say, okay, so you have these symptoms, feel it sounds like this, and you say, okay, this person understands me because they listen to me. I'll take their prescription. And they, doctors have the best sales like you they're the coldest closers on the planet if you'll pay attention to their processes and stuff just like the one I, I i just mentioned and bringing it into your sales situation it works just like diagnosing and prescribing and so the the way to get to those questions though what i do is when i get on the phone with somebody first thing i say you know uh hey dave you know uh i see that you're from austin texas i got three or four clients down there right now that are in the real estate game that are killing it and uh, they've been with me for about six months. I think our top guy did $5 million in production last month. So you're in a hot market. And it sounds like small talk. But what I'm doing is I'm already showing them that someone just like them in their geographical location is getting the results that they came to me and they wanted. Now, I'm not going to lie to them. If I don't have somebody doing that uh, in their area, I might use their state, right? If I don't have somebody in their town, I might use their state or their county or how is it the half of the United States? Oh, yeah, we got a lot of people in the western half of the United States over there, whatever I've got to use to uh -huh. be able to make that sound right. But I'm showing them up front. And what I'm doing is I'm removing that objection on the back end. They can't say, well, my market, I'm not sure about my market, or will it work here? Or, is there anybody in my market? You handle that in the first 30 seconds of the conversation. And then uh, from there, I like to ask them, you know, why we're on the phone together. It's like, hey, what, what made you decide to reach out? I think that's the most powerful question in sales is what made you decide to reach out because it implies that a decision with you involved was made. And that's one of the hardest things to get a human being to do. So if you can have that, like that small talk pattern where you show them social proof and then follow it up, getting them to admit that they made a decision with you involved, you're well on your way to getting in their, their wallet, just being uh, just being honest here. Cause it, we're programmed, you know what I mean? Like Robert Cialdini writes in the, the book Influence about the click worm method, like about these little uh, polecats and turkeys, which would normally be enemies, but they would make the turkeys cheap like the polecat, and the mother polecat would never eat the turkeys. And so it's the same thing. We're programmed with these little brain hacks like that, and when you can tap into them, and they don't have to be complicated. You know, we're uh, our lizard brains or whatever they want to call them are not Crocodile, very complicated think, yeah. at all. Yeah. And yeah. When, you, when you get into that, Yes, yeah, yeah. And, and and when you get into tapping into that mind with really simple stuff, it becomes powerful. And, uh, you know, little things like asking them to make a decision, uh, changing up to how you have the open-ended questions. And after that point, you should have six or seven, like, go-to questions that you know get the conversation started. 
we know that when someone fills out like a real estate lead form, we ask them for uh, the time frame that they're moving, the neighborhoods that they like, the price range of the home, if they have a real estate agent, if they've been pre-approved by a bank, do they need to sell the house that they live in now? Those questions will start us down the path to get us wherever we need to go to get a sale from there. But we have those go-to questions every single time. So any salesperson or business owner that has a sales uh, force, you need to have six or seven go-to questions that they ask that will lead to the, the conversation that you're wanting to have about selling your product with them. Mm-hmm. So, um, so what I'm hearing is, you know, right when you get on the phone, you know, make make a statement that, you know, shows that, um, you know, what you're. I mean, assuming that you believe this, of course, you don't want to. You don't. You don't want a wrong fit. You know, whatever you're selling, you don't want to bring in the wrong fit. But assuming you know it looks like it's potentially a good fit, you know, kind of make a qualifying statement that hey, we're helping a lot of X Y Z companies just like you. Um, excited to talk to you. What made you reach out? I mean, that that kind of gets has shown to get you in the flow there. And then obviously you have the you know the the questions for any particular business may have, but that's you know a lot of the a lot of the challenge is just getting that ball rolling, right? And then once it's rolling, most salespeople or most people in general can can you know get get in the flow of a conversation. But it, it's just that beginning part is 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 you know kind of where the challenge is. So that am I hearing that right? That's kind of what your formula is that that really really gets the conversations rolling. Yeah, it's predictable. You know, if I, every time I pick up the phone, it's like autopilot. Where you live? Oh, you're in Austin. Boom, I got people there. What made you decide to reach out? It's predictable because I'm going to do it every single time, and I know where that's going to go. Just like, again, when you walk into the doctor, every single time they draw your blood pressure, they check your heart with a little stethoscope, right? They look in your mouth, your ears. It's like always the same routine every time that you go in there, no matter what doctor you go to. It's the same thing with me every time. It's just natural routine, just like checking blood pressure for me to say, where are you from? Oh, awesome. We got people there. We may decide to reach out. And from there, it just, like I said, the the conversation starts. Gotcha. That's awesome. Yeah, I I can definitely can picture that happening. So uh, what's your opinion on answering questions as as they start happening? Do you give lots of details? Do you get some details? Or are you more deliberate with kind of a yes, no reply with maybe one piece of supporting evidence? What's your experience? What's your take on that? Do you mean like uh, when, what I'm asking the the prospects or, or no? When they're at, when they're bit. when you're answering questions, oh, when answering they're questions. when they're coming okay. back with you with questions, you know is is you know I've heard you know advice on this you know both ways I guess um, you know some people are yeah be deliberate you know answer the question don't go into some long winded deal or maybe you know some people think that you should give more details like wh- what's your take on that. Well, most people are short on attention, and so if and and we tend to most people are short on attention is one thing, right? So you want to keep it as simple and easy to understand as possible. You know, they I write one of my biggest. I've written five books. I got seven hundred thirty four blog posts. I write for Forbes and Entrepreneur and Huffington Post and a bunch of other places. And and one of the things I learned when I first started writing was that you want to write so that on a seventh grade level. Max. And the reason why is because anybody can read on a seventh grade level and Uh understand stuff. But what happens is when we're in school, you are taught to use a bunch of big fancy words and the teacher's like, ooh, you're so smart. You're good job. So you think when you go to talk to normal people that you got to use these big fancy words to appear smart and to appear an expert and stuff like that. And all those big fancy words and, and technical details and stuff like that, all they do is confuse the prospect. I'll give you a good example. In the mortgage business, uh, one of the biggest revelations a loan officer or a bank can have is that nobody wants a mortgage. What they want is a house, and the mortgage is the means for them to get the house. And I've watched so many loan officers over the years uh, take an application from a client and start talking to the client about how the bond market works and how that's tied to interest rates, and then the bank makes their deal this way and that way. And the client never even asked them about that. Right, the client like never even they didn't even care about the rate. What they want is a house. The payment seems fine to them. They just want to make sure they can move in the house in the next thirty days before X Y Z event takes place in their life that triggered them to have to move into this house in the first place. And so many people get caught up selling the wrong thing. They they think they've got to go on the technical details and everything else. So when I, when people ask me questions, 
Uh, let's say if someone says, you know, how are you going to get traffic to my website? I'm not going to say, you know, well, first what we're going to do is we're going to, you know, drop this ad with a 16 bullet point deal, and then we're going to put a picture that's attractive, and then we're going to put it on Facebook, we're going to draw a 1.1 million, you know, audience. Like, I'm not going to give them all these details with repixeling and all this other stuff. What I'm going to say is, look, we're going to put your image in front of as many people as possible. It's going to be millions of people that are going to see this. Out of those millions of people, there's going to be a percentage of them that are going to take this up on that offer, and that's where you're going to make money from. So the more people and the higher percentage, the more money you make. Less details. And I just keep it simple. Yeah, no need for the details, man, because most people don't understand that stuff anyway, and then you're just confusing them, giving them more stuff to, to think about, right? When people say, well, I need to think about this, that's because you just dropped a bunch of mind bombs on them, right? <laughs> they shouldn't have to think by the time the call to action comes. Yeah, I have uh, gotten the exact same advice from a guy named Andrew Davis, um, really prolific sell, uh, speaker and uh, – just all around business guy. And yeah, I mean, he said, cut down your proposals by 70, 80%, you know, just, and, uh, and, you know, we're starting to take that advice on this end as well. It's, you know, we feel like, you know, we're at the beginning, we felt like, well, let's show everybody, you know, we're doing a lot of shit for people, right? Uh, let's let them know about it. But, um, it's counterproductive. Uh, it, it's, you know, you think you're doing something nice. And, and that's the problem I think a lot of salespeople have is you do, you know, some, you know, back in the old days, I guess, and even probably currently still, salespeople get, get a bad rap um, because they, you know, the ones that are snake oil and all that, you know, they're mixed in just like in every industry. But in my opinion, the bestest salespeople in the world are the ones who are, you know, good listeners and straight up, straight shooters are genuine, honest. Um, so most, most salespeople, I think, are like that. I think most people are like that. But most salespeople are like that as well. So you want to like like show everybody like I'm doing a lot for you right I want you to know but it's you know you got a whole free frame from that and and, and go big picture and have, if somebody wants to dig into details well then you can go there but don't start there so um that that aligns with what I've um heard some other experts uh talk in the past now I do have one other uh question in in regards to this though as far as answering questions what about when people ask for price do you just give it to them right then and there or do you follow up with it? You know, and I know that won't apply to every, you know, this can't be a blanket answer because sometimes there does need to be details that go looked at and priced out and everything. But let's say you could give them the price right then and there. Do you do that? I feel like uh, there's two schools of, there's two ways to deal with that, honestly. It's like, one way is, like, like, for my prices, they're pretty public. So usually for our Break Free Academy or for our hardcore closer business, people already know what the prices are on it. And uh, we don't even have opt-in for our programs. It's just a sales page. The price is right there. So, you know, once you scroll down through the sales copy, so there's no opt-in or anything like that. So we're pretty pretty open with our prices. However, and, and, and if you look at the biggest ticket items like cars, houses, they're all pretty pretty clear with their uh, their prices, you know, it, houses are listed on the MLS for a certain amount of money. Cars have a sticker price, which obviously most people don't pay, but it's still there as a general guide to what that, that price is. So the consumer wants to know price up front. And if they if they ask me, it's like, hey, well, how much does it cost to come to the event? I'll say, hey, it's $5,000. You know, here's what happens. You leave with the website. Most websites cost ten or so $1,000, so you're actually getting 50% off, and you leave, and you learn how the damn thing works. And so immediately I'm just like re, re, reaffirming the value being there. And so I like to use what we call the appraisal method. And so anytime I use a price, I compare it to something else that's similarly priced and show that my product is su superior and it costs less. And so, for example, we have a program called Break Free Academy, and uh, it's like 2500 bucks a year. And the way that I do it is we have a newsletter, we have a training program where we teach Facebook ads and all this other stuff. We have a mastermind, we do meetups, like we do monthly trainings for these folks and everything. And, and so what I do is I show everybody the price of, you know, this person's mastermind might be $10,000 a year, right? And then we have a mastermind as well that's included in this. Then I say, you know, uh, Frank Kern, for example, is a friend of mine. Frank Kern's newsletter is $4,900 a year. Our, so that makes our newsletter worth, you know, let's say that it's worth half of what Frank's is, which I think it's worth double what Frank's is, but it's worth half of what Frank's is, and let's say that it's $2,000. And so we start stacking this value, appraising it towards other things that the prospects can clearly 
understand the cost of. And so it draws that contrast. Sometimes it's like uh, when we break it down for $297 a month in our Break Free Academy Entourage program, we're like for less than $10 a day, for less than the price of a super size Happy Meal, you can get, you know, uh, access to this mastermind, this newsletter, this network, this training, and all these other cool things. And so it, I like to use that because it, it, then it just draws the, the logic with the number. So if someone hits you with price right out of the gate, absolutely give it to them, then reaffirm it with the appraisal method. Gotcha. All right, well, moving towards the end of uh, the sales process and, and, and this podcast interview is closing. You know, you're called the hardcore closer, but I assume you don't come across as pushy because um, if you did, it, you probably wouldn't have uh, gotten that moniker, <laughs> even though it kind of sounds that way, but you, you wouldn't be closing a lot. So uh, what, what tips or advice do you have here? Well, you know, I've got that name because of uh, I've always been a really good salesperson. I've always been a closer, but I've, I've had a pretty rough upbringing, so that's how the the nickname started. I, strangely, I didn't give it to myself. Like, people just started calling me that, and I was like, that's a cool nickname. I'm going to go with that before they give me a stupid one. And so I just kind of stuck <laughs> with it, and it became a brand. Um, but the thing is, like I've said this this whole show, if you want to close sales, you have to – Ask questions, listen, demonstrate that you have empathy, meaning you understand their situation, meaning they know that you understand their situation. And when you make a suggestion, a.k.a. a call to action or an attempt to close, uh, then it's more like prescribing them a solution to their problem, which they're more apt to take to the pharmacy, in this example, uh, versus trying to sell them something. It's like, hey, if you want out of that misery, that pain, or if you want that excitement that you're searching for, whatever it is that the result that they're looking for is, it's like, I can do that for you. Here's how that works, and here's what you've got to do to be able to attain that. And it makes it different than, you know, trying to talk somebody into uh, buying from you. You know, back in the day, we would always, like when I did mortgages and stuff like that, I, I, before social media, I did cold calling and all that, and they, they used to call me the professional mind changer, right? They're like, man, Ryan gets them on the phone, he'll change their mind. And that was what was necessary to do business back then, but that's because we weren't connected. The only people that we were able to get in touch with back then were the people that advertised in the newspaper, and there was probably another 100 people going to hit each one of those people just like I did calling them as well. Now we're so interconnected just with Facebook alone and 2 billion people uh, – you don't have to try to change people's minds. You're trying to pre-qualify them so that maybe if 10,000 people click on your website and only 500 of them end up becoming leads, they're probably going to be really good 500 leads if they jump through all the hoops, like like what we have, them getting on our email list and then possibly buying something and filling out an application and setting up a schedule and then getting on the phone when the person calls them. That's a hell of a lot of hopes. Like by the time that person gets on the phone with my salesperson, they're 99% there. Sometimes – the sales guy calls them, and they say, dude, I've been trying to put my credit card in this thing. It doesn't work. That's why I scheduled time with you. Can you help me out? Usually it's, it's a lot of times real simple stuff like that because we've done everything up front so that when we prescribe them, which is actually truly closing, but when we prescribe them with the product that will provide the solution that they're looking for, the results that they're looking for, then it, it, just, it just changes how the whole conversation. And these days that's what you got to do because you're right. If I was some pushy a-hole that was – you know, made everybody super uncomfortable and everything else, I wouldn't have a quarter of a million followers on Facebook and people buying from me because nobody would want to come around because they'd be scared I was always trying to push them into making bad decisions they don't want to make. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it sounds like it just naturally happens. You know, it's basically yeah. you present everything and it's like, all right, well, you know, what's the next step, right? And, and you don't really necessarily need to – even say much it just naturally happens and and, and that's also something i've uh, experienced and learned and 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 a hundred percent um in, endorse and agree with um so very cool but now what if the call isn't uh you know it's not like a one call close you know it's not you know it there's multiple calls calls that need to happen multiple meetings that need to happen so when this initial call comes to an end you know what are some of your advice or techniques to, to take that next step, you know, to, to set up the next step and, and keep, keep the, you know, keep the conversation rolling and moving forward. So yesterday on the sales call, I was pitching this guy's $30,000 product. And when we got to the end, he goes, man, I really like this. And I need to cancel because he was already paying, 
eight grand a month for another service. My service is 2,500 a month if you broke it down. And he's like, man, so you're already saving me money up front. And, and just by like canceling that other service and coming over with you guys, he said, but here's the deal, you are asking me for 30 grand. And uh, that's a lot of money. And I, I don't, I need to uh, sleep on it because hell, I, I know that you're the hardcore closer. So I got to make sure you didn't talk me <laughs> out of anything. And I got to sleep on it for the night. But, uh, but I just, I just need some time to think about it. I said, that's awesome, man. Well, what if I called you back on Friday? Would that be enough time for you to, you know, make a decision whether you're in or out? All you gotta do is let me know. If I called you on Friday, would you be able to confirm that? And he's like, yeah, man, just give me a shot on Friday. So on Friday, I just follow up with the guy. I get the final decision from him. It's going to be a yes, right? He just wanted to make sure that he didn't burn bridges with the, the company that he's going to let go that was charging him eight grand a month to make sure his contract wasn't. I know all the details that the guy's looking through because I know his types and sell to him all the time. So when I call him Friday, he'll be all on board. But the key is you have to make it to where, just like in this situation, I made it to where it's totally comfortable for him to think. I didn't try to pressure him into doing a one call close because I know the money's made in follow up because most people won't follow up. But all I got to do is just be a little bit better than the next guy and following up and I get a long ways ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you just set, set the, to suggest the next step, suggest, suggest the next call or, you know, whatever, whatever it might be, just cash, you know, don't push, you know, but you know, do, do make sure, you know, if he says that, don't just say, okay, sounds great. I look forward to hearing from you. All <laughs> right. Uh, go ahead yeah, and, exactly. and set, set something up next. Okay. Very cool. Now, uh, one push last question before next contact, That's push the for close, next right? Step. If they're not ready to make the decision, like if they're not ready to make the decision, you don't have to push them to make the decision right then, but you need to find out how long they need to make that decision. And then you need to set a time for you to call and get the final decision from them. You shouldn't have that second call and you can set that expectation and they'll be like, okay, I just need three days to think about it. I'll give you a for sure answer on Friday. That's a done deal. You know, like absolutely perfect. And so all you're going to do is follow up Friday and they know they're making a final decision. They've had three days to think about it. Should make your life pretty easy. Yeah. So bottom line is very, very important. Everyone listening out there, set that next step. Set that next step. It's 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 paramount. Um, and and what, what about any creative ideas? Creative ideas you can share for touches you do maybe right after the call. Like, do you send a you know funny little gift? Do you send a video message? Do you send an audio recording? Or do you just send an email? Is there anything that you've done that you've seen success that kind of helps you stand out without you know? You know, fine line between being annoying and awesome, right? <laughs> so, uh, have you done anything in that regards after you called to kind of, you know, continue to build that rapport through through some sort of creative follow up? You know, just a thank you follow up or whatnot. Uh, any, anything you can share there? Yeah. So, as far as the, uh, the the schedulers that we use, as soon as the time of the schedule is over, so. Say that our, we're on the schedule for 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock. And so that's our schedule. So at about 11.15, there'll be an email that goes out to that person that's on that schedule, uh, letting them know, hey, thanks for the call, blah, blah, blah. Which kind of sucks sometimes you miss the call <laughs> or they don't answer. And they're like, we weren't on the call. But it's something that automatically goes out and it works, you know, 100% of the time, 64% of the time. And so anyway... Uh, the other thing that I do, though, is I try to find out if they're not ready to make a decision yet. I try to find out what it is uh, that they're looking for more of. And since I've got so many blog posts and books and everything else, I'll say, well, cool. Well, when we hang up the phone, I'm going to give you two or three blog posts that will help you get started, help you push towards that decision for when you're ready. So I kind of give them uh, some more material. Just like if you were to go meet a financial advisor uh, or go to a multi-level marketing event or whatever, the people that don't make the decision right there on the spot, they leave with the perspectives, they leave with the marketing material. I like to do the same thing. It's like, hey, if you're not ready yet, let me drop you some links to my website to show you some of the cool stuff that we're doing. Okay. Very cool. All right. Well, awesome. Uh, any parting thoughts before we have to let you go? Nope. I feel like I talk more on uh, this podcast than I ever have other than my own before. So hopefully I gave uh, somebody some light bulbs went off out there because I gave a lot of really good information that if, you know, if, and the problem is smart people listen to podcasts. And with smart people, we tend to think that we know better, right? Like, oh, well, we know better. But we got to remember the general public is not as smart as we are. And I don't mean that the general public is dumb, but I mean, for example, with this show, you guys are really good at marketing. The general public doesn't know a whole lot about marketing. 
So you're you're smarter than it. And like we were talking about trying to demonstrate earlier that you're smart. The, the, the thing with sales is just say don't. Right? You don't have to. You know, it, like a lot of people when they listen to me talk, they say, "But well, that's too simple to work." It's not. The simple stuff's what works. Like you said, the crocodile brain, that lizard brain, whatever you want to call it. The simple stuff's what goes into and and gets people to go into agreement. That's why NLP so so uh, powerful. So the parting words for me would be, don't knock the simplicity of what I shared with you today. It's some powerful stuff I just put in your hands. Understood. All right, how can people continue to learn from you? Best place, I'll give you uh, two two places to reach me. First, we go to hardcorecloser.com. You would love that site. I, like I said, I've written over 700 blog posts on there, another, you know, four or 500 pages and, and stuff that we've created. There's tons of videos book reviews, podcasts, like you name it, it's on there in regards to sales, marketing, Facebook ads, all that kind of stuff. Um, so go to hardcorecloser.com. You can get a free paperback copy of my best-selling book, Elevator to the Top, if you go to elevatortothetop.com. Uh, it's also at hardcorecloser.com. If you go there first, you'll see the book offer as well. Uh, but you can get a free paperback copy of that book at elevatortothetop.com, and that'll walk you through our funnel and all the upsells and the extra programs we sell on the back. So uh, a, you can buy stuff, but B, <laughs> you can also see how our funnel and stuff works. Gotcha. Awesome. Well, hey, really appreciate it, Ryan. Lots of great stuff here. Um, definitely some take-homes that people can start applying right away, which is what I always love to provide everybody. And I uh, really appreciate your time and, uh, and, you know, looking forward to speaking with you again down the road. Thanks for having me on, Dave. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you.